Well, as you can see here, the uh, 1369 is back. This was my locked up L1 from my last video at the beginning. And while it has been improved by Lionel service and has been returned to me in a pretty timely manner, um, it hasn't been fixed 100%. So while it won't lock up uh, in reverse when trying to back a train, it will still lock up if it's fully stalled running in reverse. No issues whatsoever running forward. So um, I will demonstrate here and then we will head into the shop pretty quickly here and uh, see if we can't figure out what's going on. So here's our L1 at roll speed in reverse and you can see it's pretty fairly smooth. Just how you'd expect a legacy locomotive to operate. If I put a little bit of load on it, it's fine. You can actually feel the engine push harder against your hand, and, and as you should. But if I put enough load on here to get this thing to commit to a stall, we've got this situation. So basically what happened is the gearbox fully locked up. As you can see, the legacy motor driver kind of goes into a self-protect mode, which is really cool. That, that's very cool that it can recognize an issue and respond before you smoke all the MOSFETs off the board. So the classic workaround for this has been to free the gearbox by just, you can see that it's locked here, by doing that, which isn't like something positive for the longevity of, of a gearbox. So then once, once we've got it freed up, you can see that it's pretty freewheeling here. These are supposed to be very low friction gearboxes. Um, we can reset the electronics with box one zero or reset, and then we're free to go about our business hauling freight. All right, so we got the L1 in my Bowser cradle here, and I wanted to talk about one of the other situations where this engine would find itself in trouble on my layout, and that is when, as, when it was backing through my Atlas number five, my back-to-back uh, -back number five crossovers. These pickup rollers are a little bit twisty about the, the vertical here. And they can move around just enough and get off center where these pickup rollers would find themselves uh, in a nice spot where they could lock themselves into my uh, into my switches. And you know, as you know, running in reverse, this engine doesn't like to uh, experience a stall situation. So I had already printed out a set of um, pickup roller mounts. For the other L1 and they're just a little fatter laterally so they don't allow the uh, pickup rollers to twist around so much just uh, keeps this engine uh, out of trouble so we're gonna change those out while we're in here all right so here's a peek down into the uh, double reduction gearbox so as you can see this is the input from the worm here and there's a uh, kind of a secondary gear that drives the final gear down there. So I think the final gear ratio, um, motor versus driver rotation is 16 to one. So pretty good gear ratio. And this is what's going on in here. So here's our uh, Mabuchi RS385 motor off of the mount. So here's the mount, nothing terribly special. Just holds the motor at a certain angle. I found these clear plastic shims and washer halves under that gearbox cover. The washer halves were kind of at the rear of the gearbox here. And these items were in place, I believe, to adjust gear mesh. The most critical dimension here is the center line distances between the worm gear and the worm wheel, which is that first input gear. So the thickness of that gearbox cover combination motor mount is what controls the gear mesh and the shimming is the fine adjustment of that. 
I feel the worm gear and the worm wheel were uh, centered correctly, so that wasn't really the issue. An interesting thing about this worm gear is that it's a multi-start worm gear. Um, the typical classic worm gears of, of the uh, recent past only have two starts. This has like four, I believe. Pretty interesting. Um, but the biggest issue with these is I think there's not enough worm threading on that worm gear. And I think that's what contributed to the, uh, the lockup in reverse. So since a problem only happened in reverse, I got into looking in this gearbox a little bit and I realized that the motor kind of gets sucked into the gearbox in reverse. And I figured that basically the worm gear was putting itself in a torque prevailing situation, which is just basically it turning itself into a screw. So I thought about slotting the gearbox cover so I, I could adjust that longitudinal clearance. There's a long running and meandering thread on the OGR forum regarding these engines issues. And I had participated in it here and there and mentioned I wanted to slot my gearbox cover so I could adjust that longitudinal engagement of the worm. And it was Pat Harmon Yards that said he had tried shimming the motor after reading that and had some uh, successful examples of um, providing enough clearance. So I thought, yeah, that's a lot easier than slotting this gearbox cover and Maybe I'll try 3D printing some shims to fit on here. All right, so here's what I made. Let's uh, give these a try. The idea is I'll just fit right there. Okay, so I believe I have the problem on the run. By slightly shimming the motor in a longitudinal direction, I've given that worm gear a little more freedom to uh, wind up upon that input gear in reverse. So we're not screwing ourselves onto the uh, input gear and creating a torque prevailing situation, which is something you don't want in a freewheeling gearbox. So I really feel like Lionel really went through the uh, extra work to get these things to be as friction free as possible. But I do believe these things really need to be adjustable in some sense, whether you can uh, adjust the uh, worm centering, I guess. And and maybe the, the, maybe the um, gear mesh. So I don't know, kind of, uh, that's something I really want to ever have to do again. But you can see here's my 3D printed shims. And you know, I started, I made uh, some really thin ones and went all the way extreme here with a two millimeter one. I think I have about a half millimeter one in there now. I don't know if you can see it. So I used my handy Amazon laptop repair hardware. Um, seemed to be M2.5 in there. And I just needed a slightly longer screw um, because the original ones were pretty darn short, these guys here. So I think I'm gonna run with this. I'm gonna put this back together. I'm gonna get the uh, tender there KDIized with my KD adapter. Also gonna put in my custom <laughs> non-rotational roller mounts. Let's see if we can't get this thing weathered. Okay, so one last look before I button it up. You see all the fun stuff they put in these modern engines. That smoke unit with two fans, no less. We got our tube going to our whistle steam outlet hole there. And uh, that looks like a lighting distribution board, I guess. Pretty cool. Hopefully I never have to look in here ever again. Almost forgot this. It's in there though now. I guess if you ever hear some kind of metallic scraping, come look at this thing first. I guess this is a uh, smoke unit shield. So if you get too crazy with your smoke juice, I don't know, I guess it doesn't splash all over the encoder. Anyway, it's in there now. Anyway, I'm gonna get ready to KDI's the tender here so I'm taken off the electrocoupler and I just wanted to stop and admire this 
nice setup, nice clean setup. We've got a couple of nice two watt speakers in here in parallel. And uh, they are baffled and enclosed, which is really nice. So these, these engines actually do sound really good for, for being a small engine. Um, I don't know if it quite makes up for the gearbox adventures, but it is a really good sounding engine. Now, one other note on the grease ports, this is the only one that's effective. I don't know why Lionel puts these grease ports sometimes on these plain axles. You're better off just oiling the uh, bushings in here. This is the only one that's getting you into the gearbox. So if you're gonna take a gearbox apart, you might as well just paint the gears with grease yourself. This thing you have to pump in, I don't know how many milliliters of grease, but it, that gearbox is pretty cavernous. Well, I guess after all of that, we should probably talk about why I got these engines in the first place. I, I guess the uh, first thing was that they were a pretty attractive street price for being uh, full scale, uh, medium sized steam. You know, they are Penzi, of course. Um, I bought them with the understanding that they're not a perfect model, but I did not expect to have paint issues. I did not think that the DGLE would be so army green right out of the box. And of course the bigger disappointment was the performance locking up in reverse like that. So when I first got the 1369 here, you know, I decided, well, I'll send it back to Lionel and let them deal with it. And then, uh, when it comes back, I'll get to it because I had the 1343 all set up. And it's kind of where we're at now. I um, didn't want the problem to best me, so I wanted to take it upon myself to figure it out. Not that I want to do that all the time, but it was maybe not so fun, but it certainly was educational. And uh, in any case, behind us now, and I'm going to get this ready to go into the paint shop and do a weathering job similar to the uh, 1343 and then bring it back out to the layout and uh, I hope to enjoy it for many uh, years to come. I did go and set up a uh, KD 740 series coupler for the front here. Sometimes you can get lucky with the dummy couplers. Um, an 805 might grab it, but it wouldn't in this case. So I, I got this guy ready for the uh, double heading action that'll be coming later on. And before we head into the shop with the uh, 1369 here, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the color complaints. Uh, depending where you go on the internet or in real life, some people are just um, maybe not getting it about why a guy would complain about some of these not so good attempts on the uh, DGLE color here. So here's some recent examples of some fairly modern O-gauge Penzi models, and we have here a uh, Lionel Legacy S2 Turbine, uh, Vision Line CC2, and a, a fairly vintage Atlas GP7. So these are possibly future projects. You can see they're in their unsullied form right now, but you can see the uh, difference in color. So depending on how I hold my camera and what mood it's in for uh, color correction and stuff like that, it may have been difficult for you to to discern just how green or not green this was to your eye. But here's a good color comparison. And these Lionel examples are, you know, fairly recent examples. And the confusion on the customer end of things is, why can't they use one of these colors that have been acceptable in the past as a standard? Um, I, I have to say, I am really not impressed with Lionel's color choices. Uh, the decoration, the paint, seems to be applied very crisply like we've enjoyed in the past, but the color picking, um, somebody just is not getting it there. Hopefully this kind of clears up any confusion. I think this is a good example of what we're talking about when we complain about colors. All right, so most of the major spray work is done on the 1369 here. Just a couple coats of dull coat. Most of this stuff now is uh, grimy black. Got everything masked off. Got some streaking done here. So uh, the next is um, 
a little engine black for some extra soot around the uh, smoke box around the stack here. Some maybe railroad tie brown on the edges of the driver's running gear. Get the coupler. Do the same thing to the tender, basically. I think we should be in pretty good shape. That'll be most of the spray work. Then I can move on to doing some uh, dry brushing and any touch-up that's needed. So, so um, I always get the question, why don't you like to run the smoke units? Well, this is why these wet spots. Um, me personally, I think I tested the uh, smoke unit on this engine just to see if it worked and promptly shut it off. Uh, this may have come from uh, factory testing. I don't know, but anyway, I'm going to see if I can clean that up. Um, I'm going to do the old uh, Q-tip and some Windex and a hairdryer trick and see if I can get that out of here. All right, so I got them mostly chased out for the time being, but these uh, oil seepages tend to come back over time. Um, in the meantime, I'm just doing a final touch up. One thing I like to do is is uh, crush up a little bit of rust colored um, chalk pigment. And uh, I use a pretty abused brush I've had forever. It's, it's pretty stiff. And uh, in this bowl here, I've got several rust colored pigments going one thing you may never hear from a guy that does weathering on these trains is the word subtlety and i don't like to overdo this um because it'll stick out like a sore thumb so it's a very subtle effect and a lot of people kind of confuse weathering with um kind of like doing it to the point of uh, an engine almost looking like it's ready for the scrap line. I I'm trying to do something that looks like it's been in service and uh, may, as may have missed a shopping or two, you know? But anyway, it's a neat effect um, if done right. I, I try to do it very sparingly. So we're almost done here. I'm gonna do a little bit more dry brushing here and there and then uh, pull off the masking tape, take it out to the layout, give it a lighting test. Well, here's the 1369 in all its glory. I think this project is finally just about done. And we're almost ready to commence with the run part of the video. So uh, I think the weathering is, is good enough. I'm gonna stop here, not gonna do much more. And uh, gonna get into uh, running it.